This was funded by the good people on patreon.com slash alpha j show. If the 2010s told me anything, it's that we've definitely made a step in the right direction, in proving that animation can be taken seriously. Adventure Time, regular show, Steven Universe, and The Amazing World of Gumball transcended their primarily children audiences to grow a more mature fanbase through their respect to the medium and attention to storytelling. Gravity Falls, Bojack Horseman, and Legends of Korra showed us that animation can be widely beloved by an older audience without being looked at like a kid's show. Spider-Verse, Incredibles 2, Isle of Dogs, and the past year alone, let alone a decade, took animation to greater heights, despite being looked at as for kids. Even MLP, Spongebob, Family Guy carved out their beginnings of this community and brought a lot of us together, even if we don't want to admit it. The 2010s will be the decade in which those who are passionate about animation got their hands behind the tools to make it at scale for the masses. However, the 2010s will also be known for something else. It will be known as the decade in which cartoons changed their connotation. The current generations that are producing animation never really had that exposure to Looney Tunes. It wasn't something they were watching growing up. And if you, if you look at a lot of cartoons today, you see a lot of cartoons that kind of feel like The Simpsons. It's because that's what they grew up with. That's the cartoons they were passionate about when they were kids. And so you're seeing this kind of move towards more, a little more of a realistic approach or just a more of a tactile, like uh, everything's a little more logical and a lot of it's based on dialogue. There has been a serious decline of wacky cartoony shows in this decade when it comes to the big guys. DuckTales, Craig of the Creek, The Loud House, Clarence, Teen Titans Go, Milo Murphy's Law, all comedy shows, but animation wise are pretty realistic. You're not gonna see tons of exaggeration, squashing and stretching, eyes popping out of their heads on many shows today. It's about the story, lore, world building, shipping on your Tumblr. Oh wait, that's no longer shipping on your aminos. Oh, it's gonna be such a great time. Now, obviously we do have shows that are cartoony, like Wabbit, OKKO, OK Uncle Grandpa, heck, even SpongeBob took on a more wacky approach. But you can say that majority of shows on right now are more serious, more down to earth, and go down a calmer path. Where I grew up with Looney Tunes, and I'm like, I haven't seen those kind of energetic, fun, silly, animated cartoons in a long time. And I just said, well, I'll just make one. You know, I'll do it. I'll try to do it. And I know a lot of people who want to do that. And so we sat down and tried to. So it's safe to see why Craig McCracken's latest show, Wander Over Yonder, stood out so well. But we're not there yet. This is it! Woohoo! Welcome to Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Can I help you guys? Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Premiering all up. May 3rd, 2009, after a six-hour marathon of the series, Craig McCacken's second and final Cartoon Network show, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, would conclude with four new episodes and the finale, Goodbye to Blue. Being on its sixth season, including a few shorts, McCracken himself believed that the show was becoming more of a challenge to keep fresh. This Newsarama article puts it best, the fact that the show won five Emmys is up there as a pretty awesome highlight, and having a float in the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade for three years was unbelievable. But really, it's the shows. I'm crazy proud of the work we did on Fosters, and the fact that it worked just the way we wanted to. He would go on to dip his magically talented toe in the pilots of Uncle Grandpa and Regular Show, as well as work on Chowder, The Pop of Girls Rule, and My Little Pony. But it would be when he resigned, after 15 years of employment on Cartoon Network, that he started to work on his new show, Wander Over Yonder. Wander was just a character I started drawing in my sketchbooks around 2007, and I just started drawing this kind of wandering nomadic hippie guy and I just liked him. I would draw him walking around in nature. And then um, a few years, not a few years, but a little bit right after that, um, Jack McBrayer uh, 
contacted my agent and said he was a huge animation fan. He loved cartoons and he wanted to meet me. So I went to lunch with him. And as I was hanging out with Jack and talking to him, as I was sitting there, I'm like, I think I've just met Wander. I think this is Wander. I, he's the guy. He's that friendly. He's that nice. He's that earnest. He's that positive, And he's that sweet. And I was like, just taking Jack's voice and my drawings. And all of a sudden, this character started to develop and this show started to kind of come to life. And it would be set to air August 16th, 2013 on Disney Channel. So to bring you up to speed if you haven't heard of the show before, Wander Over Yonder is a comedic, episodic for the most part show about an overly optimistic galactic traveler Wander and his trusty steed who's the muscle of the group Sylvia. They travel from planet to planet and mess around with Lord Hader and his army of watchdogs. What better way to show you this than with the first episode? Soon. At the precise moment of the cosmic conjunction. Hater! You remember me, right? They set the standard of Lord Hater being so angered by Wander that he doesn't focus on what truly matters to him. His second in command, Commander Peepers, frequently tries to get him back on track, as the goal is to rule the universe, or at least the galaxy. So the many side characters you may see, like this shark dude, also has the same goal to rule the galaxy. You'll probably hear me say this more often than I should, but I enjoy the art style. It's vivid, it's colorful, which helps with the fun and playful aesthetic, and it seems tailor-made for the show. Contrast this with how Simpsons, Futurama, and Disenchantment can all legitimately be in the same universe because of art style alone. And I'm not saying it's a sin to keep a consistent art style, but with purpose. And it wouldn't have made sense to use the Foster style, for example, both art style and pacing here. Another thing I like is that the action is fast. If you're tired of shows being too reliant on non-physical humor and tons of waiting, then this show is for you. For example, in The Picnic, despite the concept being whoever stands under this tomb-like structure when the plants align gets a wish, there isn't a time when it's solely that. It's often interspliced with Lord Hater's sheer hatred for Wander, Shark Dude's wit, Wander's incompetence, oh and this war. Nothing too violent, but for Disney standards, pretty violent at times. You'd expect something like this on Cartoon Network, and I'm wondering why he pitched it to Disney instead. <laughs> latch. Oh, will you come on? Just undo the latch. <coughs> no, not the. When things do slow down, it's for that, the comedic purposes. Unless it's like Family Guy where they take that exact same joke and stretch it to a minute or two to try to complete the cycle of thinking that it's funny, to thinking that it's not funny, to thinking that it's funny again. They don't do that here. I also love the designs of these characters. Most things in this universe seem to not be sharp and less sharp than many cartoons. It's the parts that are sharp that are much more worth it. So as the two leaders are fighting, Wander wanders in and pretty much messes up things for Lord Hater. Now based off the interview, one of Craig's goals with the show is for you to love the show based off the main character, and that you can plop the main character in any scenario and he'll do incredibly well. He wants Wander to transcend the normal, or even good protagonist, and become our decade Spongebob breakout star. Well even if this were to be, we won't know now, similar to how no one can tell you 100% that Ed, Ed and Eddie was gonna be a big hit episode one. My only concern is that You want a sandwich? They're really good. Come on! I only have turkey left, but I'll let you pick. I don't want a sandwich! I'll just leave this here in case you change your mind. It's the mustard. I wonder how many people think that's funny and not annoying. One thing with quite a few episodes is that Lord Hater is actually not as evil as his design, composure, and actions would tell you. If anything, this reminds me of Spongebob and Squidward post-movie at times. Now yes, Lord Hater does wreak havoc, do things that are rude, and lead pretty incompetently. But in this episode, all you see him on is the defense. If I were a new viewer, I'd have no idea if this is how it would always be or not. So it's very interesting that they chose this as a first episode. <laughs> <laughs> the universe is no! So, uh, I'll be the one granting your wish today. Yes, I wish. You know, hater, when you're right, you're right. Best spot ever! I wish you would leave me alone for five seconds! Yeah, okay, I can swing that. <laughs> 
no, 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 I mean- So Lord Hater is not going to get what he wants, but rather waste his wish on getting Wander to leave him alone for five seconds. Unfortunately, that counts as a wish. Of course, an intergalactic magical ritual wish giver doesn't provide a confirmation on the wish. But there goes his chance, and of course, this sets the norm that Wander will always be a thorn in Hater's plans, regardless of if he likes it or not. So now that you have a feel for the episodes, I think it's only fair to talk about... I want to make something super clear about The Rise. There are 43 episodes in total when it comes to Wander Over Yonder. This breaks down into 79 segments in two seasons. Of these 79 segments, how many of them do you think aired on Disney Channel? The bigger of the two networks, and how many of them aired on Disney XD, the much, much, much smaller of the two networks? Do you think half? Well, if you do, that's pretty modest. I consider you a very generous fellow. How about a quarter of 79? So like, um, 19. No. 14 segments of a 79 segment long show aired on Disney Channel. Only 8 episodes by production code aired on Disney Channel out of 43 episodes. That is 18% and I cannot figure out why. I scoured the same news outlets that announced the show and all they have news on is that it doesn't continue but why would Disney do this? The ratings were incredibly solid so it couldn't have been that. It couldn't have been that the show tanked right? So I developed the plan. Let's compare it. Let's compare it to other shows that were airing new episodes in 2013, so that would be Gravity Falls, Phineas and Ferb, and Fish Hooks, if we're counting original animated programming. So as you see on the screen, Wander Over Yonder basically had a natural dip from the high 2 millions to the mid 2 millions, as many shows after their pilots do. Phineas and Ferb would go as high as 3.76 to as low as 1.70 million. Granted, a large portion of this season was on the app, and this is Disney's cash cow, it's front runner, it's Spongebob, so maybe not count this. Gravity Falls would have been concluding its first season to also be on Disney XD, but luckily that show ended and wasn't cancelled with two more seasons written. It also got an average of about a uh, low to mid 3 million range in terms of viewers, with some dipping a little lower or a little higher. Fish Hooks would be at the end of its second season, and the start of its third season, racking up a consistent 2 million some viewership. So getting back over to Wanda Over Yonder, that was doing as high as 3.13 and as low as 1.91. So it couldn't have been because of ratings, it couldn't even be based off a of projection. If Disney based its first 14 episodes to predict the show was going to be crap, then why would you keep DuckTales on? Now obviously adjust this to today's standards of good ratings, but it only seemed to improve from its low start. So unless Disney is a giant hypocrite with double standards, which is plausible, it couldn't be because of ratings or projection. Could it be episode quality? Possibly. But let me show you these 14 episodes in a broad sense. I don't want to stay on them too long. And I want you to come to a conclusion based off of what you see and what you hear. The Picnic. That was the first episode, we just went over that. Weak episode in a few areas, but overall fine, I suppose. The Greatest. Lord Hater competes against Wander in a series of challenges to see if he's the greatest in the galaxy. Oh, this guy makes me so mad, I just want to go to his booty little face and- ah! But come on, you gotta be crazy to try and stop Hater. <laughs> right, Wander? Wonder? This was a much more fun episode, with there being a competitive element here, than rather, I'm just gonna poke you and watch you overreact. It also sets up the standard that Lord Hater wishes to be the greatest in the galaxy. Overall recommend. The Egg. Wander and Sylvia try to return an egg to a nest belonging to a beast who Wander thinks is the egg's mother. <laughs> I love this episode because it was a constant struggle back and forth. It had wackiness, but was also action packed with a clear goal, and it had a moral underlining it, the complete package, rather than being the shining billboard it could be. This is one of the few rare great Sylvia episodes, with her being a great counterbalance to Wander's actions, supporting the story rather than padding it up with the obvious pushback she will give to Wander's actions. The Fugitives. When Wander and Sylvia become fugitives, Sylvia's escape plans constantly fail when Wander ignores them to help someone. <sighs> That's better. A pretty good example of when Wander over Yonder can get very predictable. I think it was pretty clear how helping everyone would come back to help him. And a good deterrent to me thinking that this episode is tried, true, and played out would be to add comedy. However, they played the story extremely straight, and I didn't find any of it endearing. The Good Deed. 
Every time Wanda does a good deed, it causes something bad to happen as a result. A marvelous episode. I love the fact that it being simple, it had a layer of unpredictability to it. Yes, the structure was pretty bare bones, but what some episodes lack is that combination of funny and unpredictability that this episode manages to find a sweet spot in. The ending scene had Wander actually lose hope, which while yes, we don't need to happen every episode, the rare time it does, it gives this emotion weight. I'd recommend it. The pet. When Wanda and Sylvia board an abandoned spaceship, they encounter a horrifying alien monster pet that is bent on attacking them, which Wanda names Captain Tim. What a neat trick, Captain Tim! Sylvia sees the wild beast as a threat, but Wander takes a liking to the ferocious little monster and tries to train it to be his pet. This had incredible visuals on it. And even though I don't really care much for the whole new world, every show, they're in a new uh, galaxy with new aliens and new creatures. Selling point, when I see visuals like this, I do appreciate it. As far as the pet itself, his design is gross, but I love it. I love how angry he is. And the fact that he's a wild animal gives Wander that much of a challenge. Also, the fact that this pet comes back later in the series, which I won't spoil, is a cute way to develop what is essentially a feral wild beast. The Prisoner. When Peepers takes Wander prisoner on Lord Hater's ship, he lets him get loose and must recatch him before Lord Hater finds out. This was a much needed episode to flesh out Peepers. I love this episode. It's one of my favorites in season one. I love the fact that he doesn't see what we see in Wander, which is a ball of optimistic hyper energy that you cannot contain. Also, it proves Lord Hater right that Wander isn't exactly aloof to the fact that he's trying to be captured and destroyed all the time. It's funny and the other watchdogs provide a great role within this episode. The bad guy. Wander and Sylvia land in a town inhabited by bad guys and pretend to be bad themselves so they can get to safety. I'm a wanted man. 10 million credit reward for the capture of Badlands Dan. I'm a wanted man. 10 million and one credit reward for the capture of Wild Wanna Wander. Loved Wander acting like a bad guy. I mean, it is confusing that he could act like a bad guy here, but in other episodes, he couldn't even muster up to not help someone or do a good deed. The consistency is as strong as these guys in the end. I won't spoil that. It's just a lot of playful mean mugging and different gangs and groups. I loved it. And Wander should be more like this if I were giving the character direction, rather than like in The Fugitives, where his niceness becomes near incompetence, and annoyance for me at least. Love this episode through and through. The Troll. Prince Kashmir and his goat warriors of Bahala work to fight a menacing troll, but Wander sits out. A return from a whence you came, and we shall not harm you. Return from whence you came, I'm Kashmir, and I sound like this. Herdy, 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 herdy. I think it was an okay episode, it covered the basis it needed to, and its solid execution made it not unwatchable. This was also the episode that made me think that 99% of these episodes are pretty much the same. Wander does one thing, Sylvia does another, Wander's way works every single time. They try to portray Sylvia as the smart one, but either each episode is in a bubble, or she's a full blown idiot. Either way, the environment was okay, the side characters we meet is okay, so the episode overall is just that, okay. The only highlight of the episode was the enemy, and how they portrayed his strengths and weaknesses. The box. Wander and Sylvia must deliver a closed box, but Wander can't stop obsessing over opening it. Pair of socks, pair of socks, pair of socks. Pair of socks, pair of socks, pair of socks. Pair of socks, pair of socks, pair of socks. Honestly, it was an okay episode turned poor, and I thought The Fugitives was a poor episode. No, 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 no. This. This is. You can't build up the expectations of morals and Wander wanting to learn something new, or Sylvia learning that Wander's intuition is correct, to have episodes like this, especially when Sylvia is the main one that thinks that sometimes an enemy is just an enemy. More on that later. By that same logic, a box is just a box. It's literally the same logic. Just tone down. And you can even make the argument that learning that a box is just a box is easier than an enemy is just an enemy, especially for someone as optimistic about the world as Wander. This episode goes against a lot of things the show stood for with its ending, and it was just flat out boring. Definitely the worst of the 14 episodes so far. The Hat. Wander gets lost while he and Sylvia are being chased by a giant worm, and Sylvia uses Wander's hat in an attempt to find him. What? I 
can't hear you! Hmm. Ring, ring, ring! I said, catch me! This is another episode where Sylvia's stubbornness isn't used to make the episode entertaining, but annoying. It's one of those episodes where I'm screaming mentally, in my head, you're telling me you can't cut to the chase on this one? It has to be 11 minutes of this. This hat doesn't give you what you want, it gives you what you need. It doesn't give you what you want, it only gives you what you need. The hat doesn't give you what you want, it gives you what you need. So no crap, anyone with half a half working brain would figure this out. Plus this world is 95% jumping on mushrooms that fall down. The little guy, the smallest watchdog, Wesley, is left behind while on a hunt for Wander and Sylvia and holds them prisoners until he can get them to Lord Hader, but eventually experiences a big change in heart. This episode may be my favorite of season one. It's adorable, it's super engaging, it kept me on the edge of my seat. In the grand scheme of Wander, this is one of those episodes where you didn't have to do it, but I appreciate it so much. It appears to be a special because it's longer than most, and essentially it's your standard little guy story. Little guy has big dreams, little guy gets laughed at by his peers, pretty much needs to be dragged and begrudgingly helped along the way. But Wesley is one of my favorite characters, at least side characters. His entire arc was covered within in this episode, and I kind of want to review this as its own separate thing. The Ball. The two friends help the inhabitants of a planet defend themselves from a giant cosmic dog that mistakes the planet for a ball. This episode gives me the mood of the father that comes home to crying cranky kids for the 5,000th time, and he's all like, yes dear. In fact, that was a cutaway scene in Spongebob, so let me find it. <laughs> right here. Coming to bed, honey? Yes, dear. You see that face? That face he's giving right there? That was my face when I watched this. I mean, yes, sure, it's a perfect planet despite the fact that it keeps getting destroyed by the same thing for the same reason, but whatever, it, it's not a terrible episode. It's just okay, it's fine. It's not that funny, Sylvia's pretty much like any other character, eh. And lastly, the 14th episode, The Bounty. Lord Hater hires three bounty hunters to capture Wander and Sylvia, but Commander Peepers tries to stop them so he can have all the glory to himself. This was a cool episode, I seem to lean towards Commander Peep slash Watchdog episodes. I've noticed, I will give this episode this, the struggle of trying to get Wander and Sylvia himself is at least a breath of fresh air, where it isn't Wander doing something that obviously will work out in the end. Good episode. Phew. So as you can see, these 14 episodes all aired on Disney Channel, and they aren't horrible, besides maybe the box, there isn't anything inherently terrible about any of these episodes. On the outside looking in, it just seems like a rash decision to do this. For any new people, let me explain. The reason why putting a show to Nicktoons, Disney XD, Boomerang isn't the best idea is because of the low viewership, which means lower revenue coming in because of that show, which reduces the incentive to keep it going or put more money into it so that it performs the best. While one may look at the lack of competition there, that isn't enough to justify that many of these shows could go on and have have more stories if companies push them properly from the beginning. Either that or merch sales. Merch sales seems to be the death of way too many cartoons. Either way, despite being about or over halfway through this video, the rise is actually shorter than I make it out to be. So now that you know that it was cut to Disney XD extremely quick, let's talk about... I will separate the fall into four areas, starting with part one. So there's something I want to show you with Disney animated shows. Let's see if you follow along. The Proud Family, 52 episodes. Fish Hooks, 58 episodes. The Replacement, 52 episodes. Brandy and Mr. Whiskers, 39 episodes. The Emperor's New School, 52 episodes. Lilo and Stitch, 65 episodes. American Dragon Jake Long, 52 episodes. 
No, obviously, your Phineas and Ferbs, Kim Possibles, even their recent Mickey Mouse series have aired much, much longer. But it clearly isn't a luxury given out. Once you hit 52, it's highly unlikely on Disney you'll go over unless you're a hit, which makes sense. Now, some of you may point out that it's basic business knowledge. Don't push something that isn't working. But then I must ask, can you point to where Wanda Over Yonder wasn't working in a business sense? There seems to be a 52 episode hard cap, which is okay, just unusual. Wanda was getting awfully close with 43 episodes or 79 segments. Could it be that Disney decided to cut ties really early and not let it hit its point? Would getting, let's see, 52 minus 43, nine episodes in a season be a little empty? These are all valid things because again, it's that number that shows animated at least hit on Disney Channel. It's like a curse. I mean, I couldn't tell you, but I'd love to be a fly on the wall as to the true reason why. Now, I've gone near half or three quarters into this video, and I've shied away from the unthinkable, the unfathomable, but I must address the elephant in the room. I know this may be a bad look for me, because I don't like Bunsen as a beast, and I think it's the worst Butch Hartman show. I hear, think Wanda Over Yonder, Craig McCracken's latest incarnation, it's just not as good and it doesn't hold up as much. I know a majority of people love the show. I know a majority of people are very grateful that I covered the show. Although I'd like to see where all these fans were when the show was on. Almost seemed like people enjoy a show more when it's poorly treated. <clears throat> Sorry. Almost seems like some people enjoy a show more because it's poorly treated. Not everyone, and I would never point my finger to anyone here. I mean, look at me, I reviewed the show once in a Disney roundup, and it was my first time talking about the show. I could have covered it more and shown my support, but honestly, then and now, the show hasn't stuck to me. And one of the few major reasons why, this is one of them. Fosters to me is a show that hasn't been touched in many different areas, hasn't been surpassed in certain things that other shows try to do that Fosters did. It also has that Craig McCracken signature comedic elements, but when you put it next to the pop of girls, I love them both equally. I think both of them exude personality with their strong main characters, a strong supporting cast, and a strong purpose. The Powerpuff Girls became a hit because it was an awesome action show with a great villain, funny mayor, awesome father, and great music, not to mention the narrator. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends became a hit because of its incredible concept and execution, wacky cast, heartwarming stories, and strong main characters. Wander Over Yonder simply does not have many of these concepts. Great villain? Of course! I love Lord Hater and Commander Peeps. Strong purpose? Not really. Sometimes Wander wants to do good, other times he's literally post-sequel Spongebob having fun at other people's expense. All I know is, Wander wants to do good. So does every other optimistic character out there. Great music? I'm not a country slash banjo music hater, but this isn't exactly award-winning music composition. Heartwarming stories? Besides the little guy, this could swap with Mighty Magiswords and no one would bat an eye. Wacky cast? Hot take? Sylvia's just your poor man's Gloria from Madagascar. She's the sassy muscle, but like that's it. There's something off about her design that makes it just eh. I get she's a trusty steed, but she doesn't have a lot of memorable episodes slash moments to justify that amount of screen time. In fact, if anything, she's what's dragging the show down at times. She arbitrarily doesn't listen to Wander, which extends an already boring or solid but unspectacular episode out to its 11 minute mark. Now again, I'll be the first to say, I do love a lot of old shows more, sometimes more than the new shows, and I'm not gonna pretend like there isn't some bias when it comes to Craig McCracken shows. But at the same token, there are a lot of new shows that I love that do things better than old shows. Like for example, Gumball has better character design than Fosters, even though I appreciate the stories in Fosters more. I love the pop of Girls, but I'm much more likely to watch DC Superhero Girls. Now, as a person who just praised it for half a century just now, this doesn't mean that I think it's a bad show. It just means that it's a good show, just not a great show. The third 
part is an extension of part two in a sense. But I want to focus on Wander. He was built up as this grand character who will you watch the show for, alongside the fact that each episode is on a new world. Both of these things built up the show for this fun-loving, ultra-creative gem, when in reality, it couldn't have picked the worst time to debut a character like Wander. And the worlds? Let's talk about the worlds. Not to mention the fact that the show is about a traveler, so this being a selling point is like peanut butter and jelly, selling that each sandwich is a combination of two separate yummy things. It's literally something that you would imply if you heard the premise. But even then, the worlds are actually not that different. The people are actually not that different. This isn't a cartoon with different social classes, different governments, some planets don't have gravity, some crazy reality bending aspects. A lot of the planets are basically the same planet, just drawn differently or at a different altitude with different colors. So knowing this, it doesn't sell it for me. If you wanted to focus on world building, you probably would have did that with a more serious or at least a story based show. At least then, you can focus on how the environment impacts people a lot more and not have to cram jokes down each episode. Wander is also just another overly optimistic, never give up, do good or funny, weird but in a good way stand out from the rest of the show character that we already have like 8 others doing right now now in one shape or another. What makes him stand out the most when he's taking what other characters are doing and just being the master of none of any of those traits. Not only that, but his intentions aren't as pure as they seem. Case in point, the Taurus. This was such a weird episode that I plucked out of watching it casually. It shows a side of Wander that I only seen in episodes like The Box, where his optimism turns into this weird, self-absorbed competitive edge that needs to do things his way. Heck, even with the ball, when Wander doesn't get his his way, he turns the ship and runs it into the dog in an aggressive way. In that sense, with this context, with that logic, let's talk morals. Do I get a choice in being happy? Do I get a choice in being Wander's friend? Am I becoming friends with Wander because that leads to happiness or because that is specifically what Wander wants? What if I don't want help from Wander? What if the only thing I want to do is crush things and destroy things? Well, season 2 wishes to at least acknowledge some of these questions. It is now time to talk about three episodes in part four. Season two premieres by showing that although things may never change in season one, season two is going to change those things, all with a brand new villain. I love how this episode starts, with a dramatic shift in tone, a tone we don't see much of in the first season of Wander Over Yonder. This new villain would shift things permanently. Despite this, both Wander and Lord Hater offer their friendship and threats respectively to this new villain, despite a bigger ship, bigger weapons, and easier time destroying a planet. This is Lord Dominator. Much more focused, scarier, and powerful than Lord Hater, you'll notice that in quite a few episodes of season 2, she doesn't have to struggle all that much to take down multiple foes. Her henchmen are not eyes, which Sylvia learns quick, and Dominator is not interested in befriending Wander. I love the design of the ship here. Maybe it's because I see the ship more than the episodic world of the week, but the sci-fi but really curvy design is something I dig. I also love the way they present the main, main villain of the show now, Ominous. You barely see them until you need to, as a true villain of you do not want to mess with them status should be. Wander still decides to befriend them, but it is the way that he does it that bothers me. Perhaps you did not notice our gift! From your new Again, do people have a choice in befriending Wander? If not, then it becomes unlikable. This aggressive stance makes Wander unlikable. We also get Commander Peepers telling Lord Hater essentially that his blind fury to catch Wander has led him to not have any planets. Hater, still in denial, freaks out because of Dominator having better stuff. This petty attitude, however, does work. You want to know why Lord Hater's petty attitude works, but Wander's doesn't? Because we are supposed to like Wander. We are supposed to cheer on Wander and his actions for the most part. We are supposed to find Lord Hater's actions antagonizing. Sometimes it's not exactly like that. I also enjoy when Hater freaks out. You see tiny scribblings of his character clipped here. Also Tom Kenny's performance as Commander Peeps is great. It's like this Powerpuff Girls mayor slash Ice King voice that really works well for the character. Maybe this enemy is just an enemy. I'm sorry buddy. I know you always want to see the best in people, but sometimes there's nothing there to see. If I'm gonna be the greatest in the galaxy again, I'm gonna start with whoever this loser is. Hey, Robodork! Let 
Both Wander and Hater have a half realization that maybe not all enemies can become friends, and maybe he's not the best in the galaxy, respectively. With Sylvia and Peeper is trying to get them back on the realistic side of things. However, considering that this is the first episode of the second season, it's pretty much a fruitless attempt. Despite this, we do get our first extended glimpse at Dominator. I enjoy this silent but extremely powerful demeanor they have. However, on the other side, this is for you! And that, and that, and that! I'm so sorry. No! Sylvia, I don't think our new friend is very friendly. Uh, you think? I think this calls for the big guns. He tries, he tries, and tries, and tries, and each time gets more and more and more and more frustrated. A part of me respects this, but not to the level in which I'd forgive its near infectious spread on the show. Sometimes this is okay. But this villain clearly isn't Lord Hater, it's a different beast. Speaking of Lord Hater, once he sees Wanda and Sylvia apprehended, he turns into a different beast. This is a subtle but well appreciated way to show how Wanda is inadvertently the true fuel to defeat Lord Dominator, at least for now. In the show that Lord Lord Hater isn't always a joke, he can be a legitimate threat. Too bad it's only in short bursts, and it takes a lot out of the guy I see. Luckily, even though all four characters are getting their butts handed to them, Peeper saves the day. Or really the lava. Flip a coin. I like to believe that an enemy is just a friend you haven't made yet. But after your rude and inconsiderate behavior today, I'm not sure I want to be your friend. I know this is supposed to be like a grand turning point for Wander's character, as he has major doubt of Dominator, but I just see this as Wander finally failing at winning. Which I shouldn't root for, but like, geez dude, can we get something else? At least with Lord Hater, you have the underlining doubt as he compares himself to Lord Dominator with Commander Peepers. This here is nearly every episode he tries this. It gets old. That was Like, serious? Then I was all. We also learned that Lord Dominator is Lady Dominator. That comes into play in the next episode I wish to cover the Battle Royale. So Wander wants to set up the new found out Lady Dominator with Lord Hater with the hopes that they stop being evil because they realize they love each other. He's doing this by placing a tiny, not for real immortality ring that brings all of the villains together in a large scale war. But let's keep going. This episode, also being an extended episode like the season premiere and finale, culminates the feelings of a lot of characters towards one another. Not counting the finale, this is the best episode to portray Lord Hater's hate being used for quote good, as it's being fueled off of his disdain for Wander. He ran off without thinking even though I told him not to, threw himself into a dangerous situation without any kind of plan or exit strategy, and left me behind to save his, save his butt and clean up his mess. Do you have any idea what it's like to have a fool for a friend? Lord Commander and Sylvia have their long-awaited battle, which is great, but if we're talking comedy, this guy takes the cake. Hey, it's me. Uh, I did it. So I'm gonna get this ring now and I'm the greatest or whatever? Wait, who are you? Oh, uh, oh, um... I'm uh, the, uh, the terrible and super mean villain. He's trying his best. Something the so-and-so. I'm, I'm really strong. Look at this man. Oh my god. I really should have put more thought into this. But, oh, it's late. I've got this cape, so... Um... Dude, put down the ring and come back when you're better prepared. Yeah, yeah. Uh... He must be protected. This was such a great example of awkward comedy that it's one of my favorite moments in animation, period. Well, that and this instant KFC combo. We also get to see some creative villains, even if it is for a minute, which is a plus. The only thing of note here that I want to truly discuss is that slowly everyone gets a little bit more transparent. Peeper realizes that Hater may not always have what it takes. Sylvia realizes that Commander Peepers and her aren't so different. Wander learns that there are some things that possibly can't be solved with friendship. And Hater learns that Lord Dominator is a female, and reenacts my entire game as a boy on the internet from 12 to 14. Hi. Lady, I, so cool, pretty, not hate, like. I mean, there's a lot of action, but you kind of see that. I don't need to explain that. She does end up taking the ring, but nothing comes of it. Until the finale. Bro, 
like that was a poor choice of words. Lord Dominator does what she did in the first episode she was in, in the special we just covered, and pretty much all the other episodes, dominate. She's pretty much taken over the entire galaxy at this point. What I appreciate from the beginnings of the finale is that it plants the seeds for Dominator's eventual outing of being lonely. She built bots, but the bots only go as far as they're programmed, and thus don't feel the same. She destroys the star, but it doesn't feel the same. Like other episodes, such as the troll, a lot of her energy comes from the fact that she's antagonizing other real people, as real as this animation gets anyway. I also enjoy how Lord Hater silently gets up after seeing the last planet destroyed. As stubborn as he is, he is loyal to his cause and will go down with his ship. It was just such a subtle but neat scene that didn't bash me over the head with the fact that it's sinking in that he needs to put it all on the line. We also get some neat comedy. Dominator has driven us from our homes and kept us on the run for an entire season of our lives. Where has this guy been all season of our lives? Sylvia tries to band them together in order to form a plan to take down Dominator, but they end up bickering with themselves. It comes to a height when Sylvia flat out tells Wander she has to stick with the crowd, the majority. They have to destroy Dominator. Wander's biggest mission is to now get Dominator to be not all that super evil and terrifying. Obviously, if you've been following this video up to this point, you know how fruitful that attempt will be. Grab the subordinate! No! I destroy your best friend and I watch you cry! This becomes a focal point of the story and a great twist. You see, Lord Hater essentially want to destroy Wander, but ever since the very first episode, he's been very clear that he wants to do it himself. It became apparent in the first episode of the second season, but comes to a height here. I love this scene so much, because Dominator chooses to use emotional manipulation, knowing that Hater, while physically great, isn't mentally great. It almost gets to him, before he gets exactly what he's wanted this entire season. <laughs> Holy crap, that was amazing! Everything from the sound design to the way that they animate explosions was just phenomenal. Unfortunately, Wander was still within that ship. But I do want to highlight that Wander continuously tried to make a friend out of her, even pointing out that she's lonely. It's those tiny things in the dialogue that allows me to enjoy these special moments. It also creates one of those death fake out moments that many people don't seem to like. I actually don't mind them because while yes, Disney is not going to let Wander die, it does not impact my enjoyment of the finale. If anything, they've done death fake outs since the first episode of this season, with Wander nearly passing out before, so really it's nothing new. What? Why did you save me? I tried to kill you! Sure, you sorta of tried to destroy him, so there'll be a few awkward dinner parties, but if they can cheer for him, they can accept anybody! Hello to you! Folks call me Wander. That's my pal Sylvia. Welcome to the galaxy! We hope you will accept our humble gift of friendship. Shut up! Ugh! You guys are so weird! I'm leaving! Didn't want to destroy your goofy little galaxy anyway. It's such a shame. This is the one time I would have loved to see all of them come together and be friends, or at least all start from square one together, rather than her leaving. I get her being hardwired to be a loner, but at the same time, wow, she's really unlikable, and that's a good thing. Anyway, it ends with Hater being Hater, wanting to rule all the planets, pretty much like nothing happened, and that is the end of Wander Over Yonder. Where does Craig go from here? He's in the midst of a new show, Kid Cosmic. That's all we know. But I do know this. In the sea of realistic, dark, broody animation, if you just wander over yonder, you'll find a gem of what made cartoons cartoons in the first place. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next Rise and Fall. Just a short tidbit before the end card, these videos take a lot of time, a lot of research, and a lot of work. Even though they look great now, they can look even better with your support. 
please consider supporting my Patreon. All of your money goes back into videos like these to make them look better. Plus there's different perks like behind the scenes videos, hot takes videos, and even getting your own personal review. So check it out, patreon.com slash alphajshow, it is in the description, it is in the pinned comment. If you want to see my first one over here on the review, here you go, and if you missed the last rise and fall, I've made a playlist, check it out. Until then, special thanks to the patrons of April, and until next time, take care. Alpha out.